Hey everyone, I'm Charles Wan. Um, I'm with the Public Interest Group, Public Knowledge. Um, we work on consumer issues um, in the technology policy space. So thanks, Yarden, for organizing this really interesting conference. I've I've really enjoyed the um, the discussion that we've had so far. Um, so my background is that I um, used to be a patent attorney. I prosecuted and litigated patents, um, and now work on primarily patent policy issues. Um, before Congress and the agencies. Um, when I look at uh, matters of patent reform, I generally break them down into two, into two categories. The first being patent assertion, you know, the ways that patents are used. Um, the second being patent quality, you know, the types of patents that issue and that exist out there. Um, my original plan was uh, arbitrarily to go with only the um, patent assertion side of things, but it seems like we've actually had a lot of discussion of that already, and there have been a number of threads talking about patent quality. So I'm going to attempt to make up an entire talk right now um, on the second topic of patent quality, which I think is actually really interesting. Um, so hopefully, hopefully I say something that, that's somewhat useful. Um, Patent quality is the question of, you know, what sort of patents should be out there. I think when we, you know, initially when people hear patent quality, they think, you know, good patents versus bad patents. Um, and, you know, there's a large degree of that. I think that this is one of the big initiatives over at uh, the USPTO. I know that um, Dana's been looking at this quite a bit. Um, but patent quality, the word quality doesn't just imply better or worse. It also implies type. Right, and so you know, I think that there's there's been some discussion of you know what sort of patents ought there be in just you know within the system. Um, I mentioned in one of the previous discussions that you know I see patents as sort of a a form of government marketplace regulation, and if the government is going to be saying, well, we want to encourage certain types of behaviors, we want to encourage certain types of market practices, it makes a lot of sense for um, for the patent system thus to say you know these sorts of patents are more valuable to that sort of marketplace behavior and these sorts of patents are less. Um, recently, subject matter of patents has become a pretty big topic, as some of you know. Um, this is the, um, the Alice versus CLS Bank decision um, and the, uh, the Bilski case that came before it that decided the uh, patentability of things such as software patents, computer implement patents. But um, patentable subject matter goes back much further. Um, probably the uh, most famous originating case um, in the United States, at least, is O'Reilly versus Morse, which is the uh, the case over the patent on the telegraph. Uh, Morse had filed a patent that you know had a number of claims directed to, to telegraphy methods of um, you know sending telegraphs, and then he had this one claim at the end of his patent, and he said, besides all of that, I claim the use of electrical signals to cause things. I think he might have said like motion things, but you know, it was more or less, you know, I, I claim the use of electrical signals to cause things at a distance. Um, you know, that could be used for communication or any number of things. Um, and the Supreme Court said, you know, telegraphy, that's okay, but um, you know, saying that, you know, claiming the broad idea of electromagnetism to cause things um, is, you know, just a step too far. Um, you know, you shouldn't be able to claim to preempt an entire field of technology. Um, I think this actually is. Uh, fairly important when it comes to um, to university patents because as we've mentioned, um, I think a number of people have mentioned, a lot of the technologies that come up in this space, um, you know, are technologies at their very inception. They're um, you know very very new technologies for which the applications aren't very well known, and there is a pretty substantial risk that. Um, you know, when, when somebody's trying to patent one of these um, these new, um, very very early stage um, technologies, that the patent does tend to um, to cover a large portion of the field without knowing kind of where the direction of that field might go, how expansive it might be. Um, you know, I think that uh, Yardan alluded to this a bit with regard to um, to some of the CRISPR patents, which I will not comment on for various reasons. Um, but I think that you know, patent quality is a fairly important thing um, to be considering. And, you know, of course, the courts have um, rules of dealing with this, but it's also something that I think is important for um, to, to be dealt with, you know, kind of on the, on the private sector side as well, or, you know, on the, on the side of the applicants as well. Um, you know, there, there ought to be some sort of, like, filtering process to determine, you know, whether or not um, somebody is trying to claim too large a, um, a, a portion of a technology. For, for many years, I think, at least in the software field, the incentive was to try to claim, you know, as broad a technology as possible because, you know, the, the rules of, 
Um, the rules that the Federal Circuit had enunciated on software patents allowed for this sort of thing. Um, besides, you know, before the Supreme Court saying that these sorts of things were impermissible, we did see a pretty good amount of, we did, we did see the problems of, of that sort of regime in which, you know, people would get patents on, you know, very, very broad technologies. Um, one of my favorite examples was the, um, the EonNet case. This wasn't a um, patentable subject matter case. It was decided before then. Um, but what happened was that the, um, the patentee had a, meth had a patent on a method of um, transmitting files by faxes, so, you know, paper files by faxes um, through a number of um, continuation patents, they, um, they were able to convince the patent office to grant them a patent not only on transmitting pieces of paper via fax, but also on transmitting files, which they didn't define, um, via electronic communications, and then, started a certain, and then basically said that this was a patent on email. Um, this would be an example of where somebody has taken you know, a fairly narrow concept and attempted to take advantage of the patent system to broaden the patent out um, to a far larger thing, um, and then to you know, attempt to, to assert this against, um, against other entities. So you know, I think my, my first point would be that you know, besides you know, all of the discussion of patent trolls that we've had, um, I think it's, it's very important to be looking at you know, the types of patents that, um, that ought to be applied for, um, that universities ought to be looking at, and especially you know, the, the degree of breadth um, that you know, ought to be sought in these sorts of patents. Now, of course, patent assertion is, is um, fairly important um, with regard to universities as well. And the other thing that I want to talk about, so I'll skip all of this. Um, are, you know, what are some lessons that we can take from other areas in terms of ways of, um, in terms of ways of licensing or, you know, arranging, uh, make, making arrangements with, uh, with patents to further the commercialization of technology? Um, Three examples came to mind when I thought about this. The first was um, the, the compulsory mechanical license in copyright. Um, in copyright, of course, if you want to make a cover song, um, you are allowed to make a cover song by providing notice to the original um, composer and paying you know, a certain specified fee. Um, this has a pretty substantial advantage that it allows for all sorts of you know, innovative creativity upon existing songs, because you, know, you can take advantage of an existing song, come up with you know, some sort of new electronic or metal version or something like that. Um, and you know, make make for a, you know, make for, you know, substantial innovation in the creative space by taking advantage of that. Um, a lot of times the problem that you would face as a small composer um, is if you wanted to take advantage if, if you wanted to make a cover version of a song, um, absent the mechanical license, you would have to, you know, negotiate with potentially a fairly large um, with a fairly large copyright holder, and you know that that would be you know fairly difficult from an information perspective and just from a um, from a negotiating perspective. So the mechanical license, I think, is one example of a um, of a way in which you know we can we can look at licensing in sort of a different light. The second is um, this guy. So. So you, this is this is uh, Elon Musk, of course, and he did a thing about a year ago, which I think was pretty um, notable. He declared that all of the patents on um, Tesla and electric vehicle or on te Tesla's electric vehicle technologies would just be dedicated to the public. Um, he said, you know, no licenses are required. Um, you just get all of this. His reasoning for this was, you know, they had applied for the, the patents on the theory that, you know, potentially this technology could become, you know, very big, and they would want to, um, you know, they they wanted to have the value of patents for commercializing their electric vehicle technology, but it turned out that that didn't work. And at the point that they realized, look, this isn't going to work, the only way we're going to have um, you know, substantial development in the electric vehicle space is if we allow a lot of people to come in. Um, is to allow people to um, to take advantage of our patented technology without having to pay licenses, um, and so I think that that's a second um, example of you know a way in which of you know an approach to um, to looking at patent licensing. You know, first you know try out your commercialization strategy. If that doesn't work, you know just have at it. Um, the third is um, how many of you are familiar with these three acronyms um, by show of hands? Anybody? One. Okay, a couple people. Um, these are um, so. These are reflective of a patent licensing strategy used by standard setting organizations, SSOs. So, you know, IEEE, um, um, 
I am now blanking on other other. Um, NIST is, an, is another example of these um, organizations who make technology standards um, that you know allow for um, communications between computers um, that you know specify the format of of um, DVDs, um, things like that. And one of the issues that comes up um, in standard setting bodies is they take a lot of technology ideas. Um, and from, from different companies that they consider incorporating the standards, some of those might be patented. And so, you know, if the standards body were to just say, you know, all right, you know, we'll, we'll take this technology because we like it, even though there might be a patent on it, that means that anybody who's implementing the standard suddenly now potentially is at risk of patent infringement, and the patent owner can charge more or less as much as they want. Because, you know, if you don't make something that complies with the standards, um, then, you know, you're not going to be compatible with other people, uh, with, other, with other companies' devices. So standards, so standards bodies basically impose a number of requirements on, um, on um, people who contribute ideas to the standards, saying, if you're going to contribute an idea to a standard and you have a patent on it, then you are required to... Um, then, then you're required to license the patents on what are called fair, reasonable, and non-discriminatory terms. Um, and the idea behind this is it helps to um, accommodate the dissemination of the technology. I think, you know, again, dissemination of technology is something that we've talked about uh, quite a bit. And so in terms of, you know, looking at ways that universities can use their patents, I think that this is actually another area that's definitely worth looking at um, for, for getting ideas for um, how to go about licensing. Um, all right, I think that's it. All right, thanks.